Seeing none, we will move right along. First item of business is the update from the Executive Committee, and that's me. Let me just get this up. Um, the Executive uh, Committee met yesterday, um, and we had several items on the agenda. First was the Executive Oversight Committee, which is chaired by Pat Kelleher, our incoming chair. Um, and we had the two topics was the approval of the 2019 audit and financial statement. Um, there was a conference call last week to go over that in detail. Laura reviewed it last week and went again over it yesterday morning. There were no issues, just noted that the process has become more difficult because of new federal rules. So she has to do more work, but the audit was fine and uh, it was approved unanimously by the executive committee. <laughs> Second issue was on review of the 2020 action plan, and again, quick review by uh, the, the committee, and it was approved by the EC. So, um, number two is the consideration of the allocation of the plus up funds. We still have about 200,000 um, not committed from the plus up funds. Um, we pretty much agreed that the funding for the striped bass tagging survey was an important um, function, and that we were going to continue the funding for that. And then we opened the uh, floor for discussions on some several ideas. Um, there was uh, three or four of them, uh, Maine Lobster reporting. Uh, there was some other suggestions from the states of uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. <clears throat> and um, essentially we discussed that for a while, but they were all conceptual. So instead of going into them now, uh, what we did was charge the states to go back and maybe flesh those out a little bit more so that we can have both uh, a better understanding of the projects and the costs. So we'll be discussing those at the, uh, the upcoming meetings. Uh, next item was discuss the public input process. <clears throat> there was uh, an issue brought up about the review of the AP membership. We're not having very good attendance on some of them, so we're going to be looking into how to improve the uh, attendance on the advisory panels. <clears throat> Second issue was on the public hearing process and that um, from our <clears throat> most recent but going back further than that, recent uh, exercise with striped bass, that we may not be getting the best information from our public hearings. <clears throat> there were several states during striped bass that did surveys, uh, New York, Connecticut, and uh, New Jersey, and the uh, results from those surveys were very different from what we had heard at the public hearing in some, some cases. Um, so we still need to do public hearings, but we're going to start exploring different ways to expand our information and possibly use surveys as a new tool um, and uh, maybe get better information for our decision making as we move forward. Um, I know Tony at one point had made a comment that surveys work well maybe for the more the larger fisheries and the more contentious species. On smaller issues they tend sometimes not even to get any responses on them. So what we decided to do is to charge Management and Science and the Committee on Social and Economic Services to start looking into this and coming up with suggestions on how to what, what would be the best tools. Maybe a consistent one that came from the Commission would help because the three surveys done by the three states for striped bass had common themes about them, but um, they were you know somewhat different. So it would be helpful to get maybe the same information. And just, uh, I was surprised at them because when we did ours, um, there's the, the software on these things is so easy. You get the data in and just about hit a button and you get a, an output report that's, you know, anybody can do. Even I can do it. So uh, we're going to look into that. Next item was a report on non-payment of state assessments. Uh, there was a new policy approved by the executive committee that had been working on it. There was a, um, a flow chart that describes and essentially goes through a, a, a probably a year-long process. If there's somebody in arrears, there's some clear steps that can be done to correct that, and then uh, you know, so and, and essentially an appeal right before someone would lose voting rights. So um, that was pretty well laid out. It was approved by the EC. And we're going to consider that uh, for final discussion at the business session today. And then we had a closed door to discuss some procedural issues. And essentially, that was the executive committee. So I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Ray Kane. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, talking about surveys, uh, and we heard about it at the executive committee meeting, could New York and Connecticut share their surveys with the rest of the states sitting at the table, just so the states can get an idea of what they'll be 
trying to incorporate in their own state, and I realize geographically and spatially things are different even in a particular fishery, but uh, you seem to have success with it, and I know Dr. Davis said he had success with it, so would you mind sharing with the rest of the Commission, the states at the Commission table? Uh, I would be happy to, Justin, I, if you want to. Yeah, certainly. We could share the survey and the results. I, I don't want to slight my neighbor, but do you want New Jersey's also? Joe, would you want to put yours up also? Also happy to, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, right. Good point, Willie. We'll gladly get those around and we can start talking about it. Thank you. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on those surveys, were those vetted as license holders? Did you, was the question asked, are you a, presently a saltwater license holder? And then was that checked just out of curiosity? Uh, I'll talk to New, to New York's. We actually sent them out to our, oh, sorry, my understand. Go ahead, go ahead, Justin. So we use the database of our license holder emails to distribute the survey, but we did not verify respondents whether they were license holders. We did ask whether they were, what state they were a resident of, but that was about as far as we went in identifying folks. Um, we, yeah, we, we sent them out to all of our uh, registered license holders, both commercial and anybody in our registry, and we did um, have a question in there about whether you were an out-of-state resident or not, and, uh, and checked uh, for double emails on them to make sure that we were not getting 55, you know, surveys from one person. Joe, you? Well, neighbor, like you, we don't have a license, but we, we do have a registry, and we use the registry. And th there were questions on if you were actively fishing for that species, so. and, and also participants in the bonus programs. Dennis? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Three states did surveys. Did the assembly of your questions, were they all similar? And what did you use for a basis for information that you wanted to get from the respondents. I'll confess that we blatantly copied New Jersey's survey. They put theirs <laughs> out first. And I took a look at it and said, hey, this is pretty good. We should do this too. And we made some small adjustments um, after some discussions in-house, uh, but we largely based ours on New Jersey's survey. Pure plagiarism. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Tell us your wisdom that got you to the survey. Yeah, so interestingly, even though it, it helped, you know, guide some information on this addendum, uh, we started this well before the addendum was written. We started this when we knew the results of the stock assessment and that, you know, it suggested that the stock was in trouble. So we put out questions to New Jersey anglers on what it is that they hoped for this stock and what it is you know, by management-wise and regulation, they would like to see. So that's, that was really the basis for the survey. And I must admit, um, I had staff came to me and said they want to do a survey. I said, go put it together and come back and let me look at it. So I looked at it. So I don't know who they stole from, so, but I'm sure it was uh, a collaborative effort. So. Any other questions on the executive committee? Okay, seeing none. We will move right along. Next order of business is a second, discuss uh, process implications for ecological reference points, benchmark, benchmark assessment. Sorry, I can't talk this morning. So, Tony? Tony's still celebrating, so we're going to let Katie do it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as many of you probably heard at the Atlantic Menhaden Board, we are moving forward with the ERP assessment. It will be reviewed next week. Um, and so hopefully when we come before you in February, we will have a tool for you guys to use to set ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden. That is, reference points that allow you to take into consideration Menhaden's role as a forage fish when you are setting uh, reference points, when you are setting total allowable catch, and so forth. However, the, the tool isn't going to give you, there is no one right answer. So the amount of menhaden that you can take out of the ecosystem depends on what you want the ecosystem to look like. How much predators do you want out there? What do you want, what predators do you value? What prey species do you want to fish harder on, et cetera? 
And so we're going to provide you with a tool. We're going to provide the Atlantic Menhaden Board with a tool where they can evaluate the trade-offs between Menhaden harvest and predator biomass. However, there are already objectives in place for all of our predator species, basically, at least the short list that we're focusing on in our intermediate complexity model and for a lot of other predators in the ecosystem. There's already biomass targets and F targets in these single species fishery management plans, which limits the, the universe of possible reference points for Atlantic Menhaden if the Atlantic Menhaden Board wants to respect those boundaries and leave those predator boundaries alone. So, however, if the Atlantic Menhaden Board wants to have more say in the single species reference points for those predators, that's not really something they can do by themselves. And so it becomes a question for the larger commission about how you want to handle the use of ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden. Is this an issue for the Atlantic Menhaden Board only where they respect the boundaries set by the single species management plans and work within those? Or is this a conversation amongst multiple boards, multiple stakeholder groups to come up with reference points that balance all of the needs for all of the species. Um, and obviously that conversation, the larger conversation, is going to be a much longer conversation and really is almost the beginning of reshaping how the commission works. It's moving away from the concept of single species boards and moving into a realm where all of these boards meet together and there is no single board, it's just one board that balances the needs of the ecosystem. These conversations can't happen only at a single species board. So the Menhaden board is going to get the choice in February of do you want to go with sort of what we call, the literature calls an ecosystem approach to fisheries management where you leave the predator reference points alone and focus on Menhaden in response to those existing single species reference points, which will be a quicker process. It will let us get reference points on the books much more quickly and efficiently. Or do you want to go down the path of what the literature calls ecosystem-based fishery management, where you manage all of these species together as a consistent, coherent ecosystem, which, as I said, is going to be a much longer process. So, and that's really where the policy board, as opposed to the Menhaden board, is going to come in. I don't think we need to make a decision on this now, um, and certainly we're not in a position to as we don't even have the final approved stock assessment yet. But as this process goes forward, it's something for the policy board as well as the Menhaden board to think about in terms of how does the commission want to approach ecosystem management for this species and for all of their species in general. Thank you, Kitty. And I would just add that for those of you that are not on the Menhaden board, which is maybe one or two folks, um, Come to the uh, Menhaden board uh, in February so that you can hear and see the presentation on the stock assessment results. Questions for Katie or John, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Katie, just to be a little, uh, it's still a little confusing to me. This tool, in other words, will look at this is the stock of Menhaden we need to feed striped bass, uh, bluefish, et cetera. Then you go back from that and go to a the standard model to try to take that into account as part of the natural mortality that you need to uh, uh, account for when you, you're looking at the reference points? Somewhat, yes. So close, um, it's going back and looking at um, the single species model for the best available information about biomass and fishing mortality, and then we evaluate sort of the potential uh, quota level and how that would affect other predators and whether that fishing mortality or that quota would keep the other predators at their biomass target or their biomass threshold, depending on how they're fished in the ecosystem. Okay. Lynn, did you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Tony, this might be more for you. I, if I remember, there's a motion tabled on the striped bass board about a new amendment. And so I, I'm just curious, you know, since there, that board is possibly going to embark on rethinking if there's a way that we can tie that to this, maybe as an intermediate step to, you know, the full. I don't know if they relate, but it seems like if the striped bass board is going down that road, um, there might be a connection there.
sure we would, I'm not sure it would alter the rebuilding program unless they change their reference points and then that may have influence on the multi-species model itself. Um, but if the multi-species model just holds on to the reference points as they are, then I don't think it would change the path that the striped bass board would be going down. Go ahead, Lynn. Right, and just as a follow-up, I, I wasn't implying that, but it was my understanding that there was some talk about, you know, we have the addendum now, but then an amendment to really rethink the striped bass objectives, the striped bass reference points, all of those things going forward. So that's the piece that I was, I was pointing to. And, right, and to, to sort of follow on that, if that component changes, then that would have an impact on the Menhaden reference points that go forward. Um, and so whether you want to have that conversation with the Menhaden board as a striped bass board, whether you want that to be a conversation or whether you want that to be dictated to the Menhaden board, I think is, is definitely a policy question that the board may struggle with. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when all this is in place, um, how much effort and resources will it be to run the model? In other words, what I'm thinking about trying to put these pieces together, you get the new striped bass stock assessment, this, you know, it's way down, immediately, you know, plug that in, what's that do to Manhattan? I mean, uh, trying to, I, I'm still not quite able to picture exactly how this would work, how fast it would work. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, and when we were developing these models, we explored a number of different models, and we did put priority on models that were of intermediate complexity so that they captured a lot of the important dynamics of the ecosystem, but were still updatable on a time frame for management. I think the, the key thing to keep in mind is that we will need updated information from all of our predator species to get the most up-to-date information for these ecosystem tools. Um, and so if we could sort of align our predator assessments with our Menhaden assessment, it all worked out perfectly this time. Um, so good job us, but we want to make sure that, that we keep that schedule going forward and that's something that the ERP work group could weigh in on is what's the ideal schedule to keep predators up to date. Um, but in a sense, the the tool is really meant to be kind of a, a long-term understanding of how the ecosystem would behave in equilibrium rather than a specific year-by-year -year thing. So you're focusing on a reference point, which is an equilibrium concept of how do we get to where we want to be with these reference points. And then the single species assessment is kind of the immediate up-to-date, are we there or are we not there yet on a shorter time frame. Thanks. Uh, Bill Hyatt. Just, just curious, how, how do you make the transition to ecological reference points, to ecosystem management, dealing with all of these predators and only a single forage species? That's also a good question. So the, we also do have, we, in our intermediate complexity, we have um, these models do include sort of a, another alternate prey. So we have Atlantic herring in there as kind of another species that occupies a similar ecological niche and that has a similar uh, range, not completely the same as Atlantic Manhattan, obviously, but there's a little bit of overlap to get at some of those dynamics, especially as Atlantic herring is changing. However, I think if we want to fully move towards managing all of these predators, managing the entire ecosystem, we are going to need to make these models more sophisticated and, I, and include more data. So I think there is, and of course these models do include a lump of just other prey, other prey that's out there, and that gets lumped in together. So things like sand lances or bay anchovies that we don't model and don't even manage get kind of lumped in there as well. So I think it is, an, it's going to be, we see this as the first step towards ecosystem-based fishery management, that we're going to give you some information you need to manage predators and menhaden together, but if you really want to move towards full ecosystem-based management, we're going to need to continue to improve and refine this tool and our management process. But we can still take a really important first step towards considering Menhaden's role as a forage fish with this assessment and with ERPs. Other questions for Katie? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Katie. That was great. And uh, yes, it's going to be an evolution as we move forward. So thanks a lot. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Kind of when we're on the subject of February meeting, 
The, we're going to have a number of sort of big ticket items at the February meeting. The ERPs, Menhaden, and that's going to take a while. Striped bass, stock, striped bass uh, conservation equivalency proposals, the Cobia stock assessment. So where I'm going with all this is we may need to have a four-day meeting in February. We usually schedule three days. We're going to we're going to look at it right when we get home. Well, first of all, we need to know if the hotel has space. But so you know, heads up, we may be reaching out to to the, the commissioners saying we need we need an extra day or an extra half day at the February meeting. So we'll just we'll keep you posted as quick as we can. Yeah, Bob, thanks. I, I was thinking it might be the first five-day meeting, but whatever. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, we've had a, uh, a late request for a change to the, uh, to the agenda, so if everyone's okay with this, our uh, board chair for Menhaden is here and has some time constraints, so if, it was, if it's okay that with the board, if we move up the noncompliance findings for an... Right. Um, so if we can move that up, does anybody have an objection to that? Okay. And before Nicola starts, uh, I emailed out a memo um, from Nicola last night, uh, and I just wanted to see. I have some paper copies here. If anybody needs a paper copy of it, I can bring it over. But in your email, you should have a memo from Nicola, but emailed from me. Does anybody need a copy? Okay, Nicola, we're going to hand it over to you, so if you can give us your update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, during its meeting on Monday, the Atlantic Manhattan Management Board reviewed the status of the reduction of fishery harvest from the Chesapeake Bay in 2019 with regards to Amendment 3's cap of 51,000 metric tons. Harvest exceeded the cap on September 6 and is now roughly 65,000 metric tons. There was a robust discussion among the board of the necessity of Virginia's compliance with this FMP requirement and its importance to the conservation of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. Ultimately, a non-compliance motion was passed unanimously by the Menhaden board on Monday, and Tony is providing you with the memo that addresses the board's action and begins to make the case for the conservation need of the uh, non-compliance determination. It's important to note that the board has taken numerous actions over the past 18 months to avoid coming to this situation, including multiple postponements to uh, provide the Virginia legislature more time to adopt the Bay cap and effectively granting a pass on adopting the cap provided harvest did not exceed it. The board was unable on Monday to come up with any other avenue to responsibly respond to Virginia's inability to effectively implement and enforce the Bay cap in 2019. The motion was made with recognition given to the fact that the lowering of the cap in Amendment 3 was not entirely a response to the stock status of Menhaden, which is generally accepted as robust. The importance of the bay cap to conservation is as much for other species that depend on Menhaden as uh, forage than the Menhaden stock itself. The, the bay cap addresses the potential for localized depletion caused by the reduction of fishery and its implications for numerous other commission-managed species that utilize the bay and Menhaden as forage, some of which are in suboptimal status, including our flagship species, striped bass. The impacts of possible localized depletion extend even further to the competing uses for Menhaden, uh, including both commercial and recreational fishing activities that target the predators of Menhaden. The board stressed that the Amendment 3 cap was not arbitrarily set, but it is reflective of recent fishery performance, and it caps future harvests at that level to prevent an increase amidst scientific uncertainty as the impact of the intensive reduction fishery harvest on the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem while ecological reference points are developed to establish scientifically sound harvest limits that consider Menhaden's important role as forage. Acting with such precaution is an accepted management practice in resource conservation. The precautionary principle establishes that in the face of uncertainty, we are to take a preventative action, and moreover, that the burden of proof is shifted to the proponents of the activity. With these arguments in mind, the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board recommends to the ISFMP Policy Board that the Commonwealth of Virginia be found out of compliance for not fully and effectively implementing and enforcing Section 4.3.7 Chesapeake Bay Reduction Fishery Cap of Amendment 3 to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Menhaden. The Commonwealth of Virginia must implement an annual total allowable harvest from the Chesapeake Bay by the reduction fishery of no more than 51,000 metric tons. The implementation of this measure is necessary to achieve the goals and objectives of the FMP and to maintain the Chesapeake Bay marine environment to assure the availability of the ecosystem's resources on a long-term basis. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, hang on one second.
All right, what I, uh, and I'm, I'm taking that as a, as a motion from the board. We're going to put that up, and then we're going to have some discussion on it again. Just I encourage the board that um, some of you are on the Manhattan board and spoke to this, but remember not everybody heard the comments from that. So if uh, don't feel you're being redundant if you uh, weigh in again, and we'd like to get a good discussion and some input on this. So we have a, a Pierce motion up. Where is David? Anyway, the motion's up on the board uh, from Nicola. Nic first off, any questions for Nicola before we open it up? Adam, do you have a question for Nicola, or do you just want to make a statement? I have a question about the motion. I'm not sure if Nicola would be best served to ask, but if you'd like a question, I can ask a question, although I'm not sure who will best serve to answer it. Go ahead, Adam. So we had discussion about payback provisions. And this motion specifically says that we're asking the Commonwealth to reduce the 51,000 metric tons when the payback provision would be something less than that. So what are we actually going to judge Virginia's compliance on should the legislature act to change the Bay cap in the near future before we have to forward this onto the service? Tony. Adam, um, we, we would ask the state to put the 51,000 metric tons in place because that is the quota. And then in any given year, if that quota is exceeded, just like in any given year, a state exceeds their quota, we would reduce the quota and let them know that year that their quota has been reduced due to an overage and their quota for that year is the following. So in our quota memo this year, we will let the Bay or the state of Virginia know that the Bay cap quota is not 51,000 metric tons, but X based on the overage that occurred this year. Go ahead, Adam. So my question to Virginia then, and I understand that this has not been a VMRC issue, that the VMRC has done everything within their power to address this. The acts of the legislature are beyond their purview. We got here on the basis of Virginia had a number in place for the cap. ASMFC had a different number, so now I'm hearing that we're going to potentially be in the same place in 2020. Virginia may have a number if the legislature acts of 51,000 metric tons. The ASMFC is going to expect harvest to be constrained to a lower number, but there will not likely be anything in place in Virginia to hold anyone accountable to that lower number. Outside of just goodwill, what else could we possibly expect potentially in 2020? Steve. Thank you for the question. I believe that uh, if the legislation is crafted appropriately, there could be verbiage put in the legislation that addresses the quota and any uh, consequences that come there too as a result of exceeding the quota. So I believe the, the perfect, in a perfect world, the perfect legislation, if it were passed, could contain language that deals with overage. Okay, other comments, questions, input? Steve Bowman. I'll yield to Mr. Fody first. Go ahead, Tom. As I said at the board meeting, uh, because the reference came up about New Jersey to, in people talking to me, and I said this was a different situation. When New Jersey went out of compliance, we basically were not looking for any more fish. Matter of fact, we were looking to take less fish, but we wanted to take the size we wanted and put in the season we wanted which actually bit was more restrictive, and we were basically accomplished that. We had a lower quota. I am going to make sure I write a letter, because I was part of that process, to the Secretary of Commerce and to my uh, representatives and congressional staff, explaining that to him. And this is a different situation. This is a spatial conflict that goes on in Chesapeake Bay, which in good faith they had agreed to, to basically keep in a, on a cap. And basically it's a uh, situation for us in the compact to, to deal with and we need the support of the Secretary of Commerce. So since I was involved in the last one, I will write a personal letter besides what the state does to that effect to the Secretary of Commerce and to Sam Roche because, Roche, because I had a lot of meetings with him over this. So that's what I will do after this is, is sent. Thanks, Tom. 
Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, um, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, we don't like to be in this situation. The, as I said before, the stigma of the Commonwealth of Virginia being found out of compliance for anything is, is troubling to the Commonwealth. Uh, Governor Northam, Secretary Strickler have demonstrated a desire to improve not only water quality but the, uh, the environment in general. It's been one of the hallmarks of their administration and the team. So to be found out of compliance in such an important matter is very, very disturbing. That being said, we are here. And why are we here? We're here because this commission has the authority by law to set quotas. And they did. They set a 51,000 pound, 51,000 metric ton uh, quota for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And this commission has been overly kind to the Commonwealth in allowing us to attempt to remedy the issue that we're confronted with today by uh, not once but twice postponing a non-compliance finding as I and the administration worked with the Virginia legislature to try to adopt the cap. That did not work. So the quota has been set, and as uh, Ms. Missouri very, very um, eloquently and accurately described uh, how the quota was set, it's not an arbitrary quota. It's a quota that's based on science and based on necessity to conserve and protect the species. This is a situation in which, uh, as it was pointed out, the Commonwealth is in violation, but the Commonwealth is in violation because primarily one entity decided to uh, exceed the quota by virtue of their prosecution of the fishery. Um, and this, this exceedance was not without warning, and I'd like to read very, very quickly a letter into the record that I wrote on September 3, 2019 to Mr. Monty Deal of Omega Protein. Dear Mr. Deal, I am concerned about the progress of Omega Protein and its harvest of Menhaden from the Chesapeake Bay this year. As of August 23, data provided to the Marine Resources Commission by the National Marine Fishery Service indicate Omega Protein has harvested 43,385 metric tons, or 85.07 percent of the 51,000 metric ton bay cap on reduction harvest of Menhaden from the Chesapeake Bay. The 51,000 metric ton cap was adopted under Amendment 3 at the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission's Atlantic Menhaden Fishery Management Plan. Of immediate concern is the sudden increase in the Chesapeake Bay Menhaden harvest for the reduction over the past three weeks. And 43,385 metric tons is substantially greater than any of the previous four years, especially at this stage of the fishing season. Although the General Assembly has not adopted this 51,000 metric ton bay cap, Virginia is obligated to ensure this cap is not exceeded to avoid compliance issues with ASMFC. I personally told ASMFC's Menhaden Board at their winter meeting that VMRC will monitor the Menhaden reduction harvest closely and will accept any consequences necessary if the cap is exceeded. Your company has remained below this cap since 2013, and I urge you to monitor your activities closely to avoid any exceedance of the Bay Cap in 2019 and it's signed by me and again dated September the 3rd. I put them on notice, put them on notice based on the fact, two reasons, number one, it's the law, and number two, I, we had, as the Commonwealth, had been very diligent in trying to do whatever we could to remain in compliance. It did not work. In addition, by virtue of their desire to, uh, according to the testimony provided by their representative, they put economics ahead of conservation and the environment. They knew, by virtue of attending these meetings, that science was coming that would probably give us more certainty as what the Bay Cap may be. Instead of waiting, instead of being a good player, instead of a good actor, they chose to, the, on their own volition, after being warned, to violate the Cap. Not only to the detriment of the environment and to the resource, also to the detriment of another fishery that has not come up, we haven't spoken much about it, but to the bait fishery. The bait fishery is a very clean fishery that has stayed within the confines of the law, done everything it's supposed to do, and now if found out of compliance, the bait fishery will be negatively impacted and never negatively impacted. Those negative impacts don't just affect the Commonwealth of Virginia, it has a ripple effect uh, to our neighbors that, require, that rely on Menhaden 
for, uh, for bait. So that, to me, is somewhat very, very problematic. So where are we now? This commission has vetted this situation numerous times. The law specifically states that if a state is not compliant with the established cap, it shall be found out of compliance. And although, as I said when I left the table the other day after making comments, I believe Virginia did the right thing and we're doing the right thing by asking and suggesting that you find us out of compliance, it doesn't make me feel any the better. It's not a good feeling. That being said, the time comes when we must do what's right. And the time is right to hold Virginia out of compliance in accordance with established law. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Jay, back to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was here during the, the Menhaden board meeting uh, in the audience and listening to some of the comments. And um, one thing that kind of struck me is I think there is a feeling of, of uh, confidence on the part of some that there's no science to support the, the cap as it was established. And so I thought I'd, um, and I hope you'll be patient with me, but I thought I'd highlight um, some of the reasons why I, I reject that assertion. I, I think, um, you know, that's a, a false sense of of security that, that those folks might have. And so I'll start with some, and a lot of these will be uh, duplicative with the uh, excellent statement that um, uh, Ms. Meserve made earlier, but um, I think this will highlight um, some additional things as well and, and detail them. So just thinking about the, the stock assessment, the mechanics of it itself, um, and how we use stock assessments in our management process, there are some important assumptions that go into the projections. Those are the, the pieces of the assessment that we use to set our management moving forward. It's, it's our crystal ball. It's how we kind of predict how things will be moving forward. And so we've got a situation here where the majority of this fishery uh, gets focused in the Chesapeake. Um, and when we go into the projections from the stock assessment, we make really important assumptions about the characteristics uh, of the fishery, things like selectivity and the fleet structure that we have, um, you know, within the, the model and the projections. And so if those assumptions change moving forward, that impacts uh, our ability to meet our objectives. It impacts the performance of the projections and the objectives that the board is trying to meet won't be achieved because the characteristics have changed. And so that's uh, a really strong reason why you'd want to have some stability in the Chesapeake re region, why you would set a cap. That's why it wouldn't be an arbitrary decision, but in a logical and important decision to make. Um, on another point, there was a lot of work done a few years ago investigating localized depletion in the Bay. There were no definitive uh, causative links that, that came out of that with regard to the, the concept of localized depletion specifically, but there is ample evidence that there are extremely important linkages between Menhaden and the other species in the ecosystem in the Bay. Um, just to highlight a few of those, uh, there are studies on the natural mortality of striped bass um, based on some of the tagging work that is done. Um, and it shows that natural mortality seems to be correlated with the size of the population of Menhaden, the natural mortality of striped bass, sorry. Um, that's what I'm talking about specifically. So striped bass natural mortality seems to be affected by changes in menhaden biomass. There's literature on that. Uh, there has been lots of work done on the health of striped bass. Again, strong correlations between the size of the menhaden population and the health of striped bass in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, going up a level from striped bass, lots of diet data indicates that menhaden is in a critically important uh, component of the diet from many different predator species in the bay. 
it always shows up as uh, one of the, the highest components uh, in those diet studies. So I'll stop there. I, I could go on. Um, I'm sure you want me to, Mr. Chair, but I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, so it's not that the science has said there's no issue with focusing fishing on the Chesapeake, um, that, but it's, it's difficult to make that really strong linkage. But I think from my perspective, what the management board did when setting that cap is they looked at that weight of evidence and took a, a set of precautionary measures to make sure um, you know, these things uh, weren't going to impact the ecosystem of the bay. So in my view, the cap was set by the board, not in an arbitrary way, but as a method to mitigate the risk to that, um, to that ecosystem, not just Menhaden, not just striped bass, but the entire ecosystem. Um, and you know, I, in my view, it's perfectly logical to set that, ca that cap based on uh, an average of fishing, I, I think, um, it's the board has they don't have to think about just science they have lots of other things to think about and so when you do something like that you don't have any specific numbers that you can throw at it no specific math to do but you looked at the evidence you thought about the fishery you thought about the ecosystem and you made a decision uh, to set that cap to keep things stable for the fishery and uh, to make sure that there was enough forage in that ecosystem to uh, keep it going in, in the way that it had. So thank you for uh, letting me ramble on there for a few minutes. Um, it does not appear to me to be an arbitrary decision and that cap I think is an important conservation effort in the Chesapeake. Thanks Jay, uh, great comments and I couldn't agree more. I mean, fishery science has never been an exact science and uh, we go back in time, I've been at this for close to 40 years, and the, um, you know, we have to make decisions on management based upon the information we have. And uh, we've done very good with uh, much less information than we've had on this fishery, so it's great points. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to commend uh, the Commonwealth and, and Steve uh, for uh, the actions they've taken, um, and it's clearly uh, a model for this commission uh, <clears throat> for a state or a commonwealth to um, do the right thing and step up and uh, you know I, I think it's we don't see that type of action as commonly today as we used to and I think this is a uh, it, it, this is excellent for us to to witness this and be part of it <clears throat> um, question is I'm already hearing from constituents <clears throat> that want to sound in on this so can the Commission uh, let us know uh, when and who uh, comments should go to should it go to the Secretary of Commerce right away should it go to National Marine Fisheries Service <clears throat> what, what would be the best uh, avenue uh, for the public to comment and they're already um, wanting to comment that a foreign company is over harvesting a U.S. resource. And so I'm hearing that that's what a lot of the public <clears throat> uh, plans to uh, bring forward. Um, so I assume we'll be getting the copy of the letter and we can then forward it to our constituents. Uh, so if we know where that will go. Um, we also plan, New Hampshire also plans to contact our delegation and, um, you know, be encouraging them to weigh in on it. Thanks, Richie. Um, Bob, can you just quickly go over the, uh, the timing, of the process for the letter and, and the follow-up? Sure. I'll go over the, the process timing and then, then speak to Richie's original question. Um, the, way, the way it would work, should a motion go forward from the full commission, would be that um, I have 10 business days to write a letter for submission to the Secretary of Commerce. Mm -hmm. So that would be, um, you know, starting tomorrow would be day one. Um, there is Veterans Day in there, so we do get an extra bonus day to do some, uh, some writing. Um, but it would be, ultimately, the letter would be due November 15th, um, and we would submit that, um, you know, in time for that, that deadline. And then what happens after that is the Secretary has 30 days to make a decision whether he agrees or disagrees with the, the um, assertion in the letter. 
And then if the Secretary does agree that a, a moratorium is appropriate, the Secretary has a six-month implementation window that, that um, he can uh, exercise. So, you know, even at, at if, you know, one month from November 15th when we, he receives our letter, the, the Secretary could say, well, rather than the moratorium be, being effective immediately, we could, he could decide to push it back to February or April for whatever justification, working with General Assembly or whatever it may be. So there are, there are multiple steps um, in the process and there's some, some flexibility on when a moratorium would be um, effective should the Secretary choose to go that route. To answer Richie's question, the Atlantic Coastal Act really doesn't include a public comment provision in this. The, the, the state in question, in this case Commonwealth of Virginia, would be provided an opportunity to meet with the Secretary of Commerce or his staff um, to talk about the issue. Um, we, we could work with uh, friends at NOAA Fisheries and, and see what the best avenue for public to provide comment would be. I'm just not, you know, again, as you asked, should it go to NOAA Fisheries, should it go to uh, directly to the secretary should it come to us and we pile, you know, package that up and send it along. I, we, there's a lot of different ways to do it and I think we'll, we can talk to the representatives from NOAA Fishery and get a better process for that. Thanks, Bob. Good. Rich? Uh, Adam, you have your hand up. Is it fair to assume that the Virginia legislature basically would have zero chance to act on this prior to the secretary rendering a decision or is there any possibility that the legislature could act prior to a decision by the secretary steve considering the window that's involved and the timing that's involved as this would work out the virginia general assembly um, goes into session around the 17th of january for a 60-day session this year so the six-month window that's allowed would fall right within the uh the time frame of the uh, of the Virginia General Assembly thereabout. Good, uh, but the 30 days that the secretary would respond from when our letter gets to them, I believe, would end prior to that date that you're offering, 117. That that is correct. Uh, I'm sorry, Alicia, I missed your hand before. Did you have a, a comment on to that point of the previous question? Uh, yes, thank you. I was just going to point out that we will publish a notice of referral where comments can be submitted. So you'll see that and your, your constituents can comment through that mechanism. Thanks. Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Following up on Adam's first questions, if we lower, if, if they're, they've over harvested, they have a payback and we set a number whatever the number is, say 40,000. Next, in next year's fishing season, we will, at some point, we're gonna tell by board action that they have to lower their quota. I think that's what, the way I understand it. That would go to Virginia. The legislature will act or won't act on that number. Would that result in a further out of compliance issue? It seems like what we do is what we do. What the secretary does is what they do. So are we going to get into it, another non-compliance issue, which on the one hand, I think we have to, if nothing else, keep as much pressure on the Commonwealth's General Assembly to get their nose out of this and do the right thing. So I'm just wondering for Steve or for the chair here, what would be the action for the reduction in uh, handling the overage? I think the technical response is yes, there would be a second non-compliance finding, but I'll defer to staff if that's incorrect, and uh, I don't know, Pat will have to deal with it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you want to add to that, Tony? It only depends on whether or not they exceed that reduced quota or not. You'd have to wait to determine that so um, as part of this letter we could include some of that information um, if it's helpful to Steve in his process of identifying what the cap should be and what the quota would be for the next year and we can work with Steve to um, 
put this information out there in the best way possible to make it understood of the process that we go through, recognizing that uh, their process is a little bit different um, through the legislature and that they don't annually shift their, their quota through their legislative process. But I'll defer to Steve. To that point, Steve. And to that point, um, the legislation in a perfect world, if I were to write it, because we don't want to revisit it again, would, as I indicated earlier, would uh, indicate that the Commonwealth of Virginia would adopt the cap that's established by SMFC, and then line two would say any further conditions assigned by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, would be adhered to. I think that's the only way to really write the legislation. I'm not legislative services, I'm not an attorney, but I think that's what needs to be done. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I, I concur. If I was in your shoes, it would be the same thing. So, yeah. Go ahead, Tony. And I think that that would be also helpful, Steve, in the fact that this section of the document also contains other provisions in terms of if there's an overage, which we have just been talking about, as well as there's also the provision that um, unused quota from states and regions are not allowed to be transferred to the cap to cover an overage, as well as unlanded fish for the cap cannot be rolled over into a following year. Um, so there are also those two other provisions as part of the, the section in addition to the cap itself and reducing overages. Thanks, Tony. Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. I, I just wanted to put a finer point uh, a little bit on uh, what Dr. McNamee said about the science end of this um, coming from the state of Maryland, um, which shares the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we do have issues with disease in striped bass, and there is um, a some uh, scientific peer-reviewed literature that is indicating that striped bass are more susceptible to mycobacteriosis when um, they are not well fed. So as we're trying to rebuild striped bass and potentially squeeze more striped bass out of the bay, um, I think it's, it's very important um, to keep that in mind. And remembering uh, back in 2009 when we were struggling with the localized depletion um, issue and did a lot of studies. Those studies were peer-reviewed by the Center of Independent Experts. Um, at that point, Dr. Jean-Jacques McGuire um, pointed out that the idea of really quantifying um, how much, um, exactly how much forage needed to be in the bay uh, to satisfy increasing demands of striped bass and other predators, including the fisheries, um, and I quote, will be a difficult and possibly very expensive question to resolve. So I think it's also important to note that there are not always um, the extensive resources that are needed to develop these um, concrete answers, which are very hard to find. And Dr. McGuire went on to say that uh, one way to mitigate um, the negative consequences of this competition between fisheries and predators was um, to implement some time area restrictions and zoning of fisheries. And I think um, all of these things were very present in the board's mind um, when they made these decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, to Adam's original point, if it, if it makes anybody more comfortable, maybe if it makes me more comfortable, I suppose, um, in this particular motion, I realize it is only a motion of a finding of noncompliance, and then the actual letter that is going to be sent to the state of Virginia will be more detailed, I'm assuming. But if you took this in this motion where it says 51,000 metric tons, it would be 51,000 metric tons per year, and also uh, implement the accountability managers in a case of an overage. You can just add that little line in there and at least that, that would maybe satisfy some of my other commissioners. Um, as far as the action of the Manhattan Board, I, I, it's pretty simple. 
the state of Virginia is out of compliance. Right now they're out of compliance by about 16,000 tons. That's 33 million pounds. And <clears throat> Omega's reasoning, I'm, I'm in the commercial fishing business. Everybody knows that. But part of their reasoning was, you know, they've got boats sitting at the dock and they need to go fishing and that's it. Um, so they sent a letter and said, we're, we're just going to go fishing. I got boats sitting at the dock too. And, you know, we're in the ELX fishery and we caught the ELX quota in record time. We, and when the Fed said fishing's over, we stay tied at the dock. We didn't write a letter saying, hey, I've got 150 employees as well, and we need to go make money, and we're going. We stopped. So it, it kind of rubs my nose in it a little bit, and I don't care for it. So I, I, I applaud the actions. It's, it's, a, it's an easy decision. What happens from here may be a little bit more dicey, and we are not in a perfect world. But this is something that has to be done. And there are other ways to deal with good behavior versus bad behavior in the future, and I'll be sure to keep that in my head come February. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. And we are going to need a motion from the policy board, so let me go to Bob. Yeah, just kind of highlighting where we are. The motion that was originally up that Nicola provided from the Menhaden Board moving forward is made on behalf of the Menhaden Board, doesn't need a second. Um, but if this board wants to adjust that, as, as uh, Mr. Reed just suggested, to you know, roll in the additional provisions about accountability and overages and underages, we'll need a motion to amend that motion that was brought forward from the Menhaden Board. So there's language up on the, on the board that, that I think should capture all the additional details. I got it. It makes the whole thing a lot longer. But um, you know, for completeness, it's probably what, you know, what needs to be added to it to, to fully spell out you know, 4.3.7 from the, from the amendment. OK, so does anybody want to uh, adopt this uh, motion, uh, this, this language on the board as a motion? Eric Reed, do we have a second to that motion? Doug Grout, uh, discussion on the motion. Adam Nowalski. We discussed non-compliance on this issue earlier last year prior to the cap being exceeded. I thought I heard Tony suggest, and if I misheard, please correct me, that we would need to see how landings proceeded in 2020 to determine if Virginia was out of compliance again. I would offer that, especially with this motion in place, we wouldn't need to, that at any point during 2020 when the Menhaden Board and ultimately the Policy Board says, is Virginia doing enough, the legislature doing enough to enact this, that we could potentially take action again and I'm just looking for guidance on that because I don't believe we need to wait for the cap to be exceeded in another year to potentially pursue another non-compliance finding. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Adam, for the question. You know, I think we're looking at – we're – since the Menhaden Board has given some leniency to Virginia over the years, to, since they've been under the quota, the, the board hasn't pursued noncompliance. It's, that's very different than how we handle it in most management boards. We usually say if the, the state doesn't have the right regulations in place, they're out of compliance. So, so I think what you're going to is back to how, we, how this commission usually handles compliance. They must have the appropriate regulations in place so it's not – you know, you don't wait for someone to exceed a quota. You usually, the commission usually finds someone out of place because they don't have the appropriate quota in place. So I think that's kind of what this is doing is, is trying to ensure that Virginia has all the provisions in place for the accounting, as you mentioned, and you wouldn't have to wait until you see their performance and how they, you know, if the, if the harvest was, was, you know, really low next year, maybe they don't go over the reduced quota and those sorts of things. I think you can... The board could uh, at any time evaluate whether the 
the package of regulations in Virginia is consistent with the FMP. So you're right, you don't have to wait to see the performance usually. You normally, or the boards usually, you know, evaluate compliance by what regulations are in place, not once they exceed a quota. In other words, you know, we've got multiple quotas and multiple recreational size limits and other things in place, or, or the states are supposed to. We don't wait until, say, a small size limit resulted in higher recreational landings. The, the states are, you know, reviewed based on the size limits they have in place, not the performance of what they do have in place. Thanks, Bob. Steve Bowman. And to that point, based on the latitude that this commission has given the Commonwealth of Virginia, I think that's the appropriate direction to take. Mr. Chairman, before you read it, please, I would suggest strongly that you do not read any abbreviations, please, when you read the motion. I will try. <laughs> uh, and this is now a motion, just uh, Bob, for clarification, this is still a motion, a modified motion from the board, or is this now the, uh, from the Manhattan board, or is this now a, a motion from the policy board? Okay, great. Just to make sure we're clear on that. So this is a motion of the policy board, and let me try to buckle up here, Steve. Move the Interstate Fisheries Management Program Policy Board recommend to the Commission that the Commonwealth of Virginia be found out of compliance for not fully and effectively implementing and enforcing Section 4.3.7 Chesapeake Bay Reduction Fishery Cap of Amendment 3 to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Manhattan. The Commonwealth of Virginia must implement an annual total allowable harvest from the Chesapeake Bay by the reduction fishery of no more than 51,000 metric tons. The implementation of this measure is necessary to achieve the goals and objectives, objectives of the fisheries management plan and maintain the Chesapeake Bay marine environment to <laughs> assure the availability of the ecosystem's resource on a long-term basis. Unused quota may not be transferred to the cap to reduce an overage, the rollover provision where unlanded fish from the cap cannot be rolled over into, a sub, into the subsequent year. Lastly, if the cap is exceeded, the amount over the cap will be deducted from the next year's allowable harvest. Got it. Yeah, we will, we'll get it, Great. we'll get it. Okay, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask one of my colleagues to come up and just offer so, a little bit of advice uh, before you move forward on this. Go ahead, Chip. Hey, everybody. Chip Lynch with NOAA's Office of General Counsel. Um, I made some comments uh, the, a couple of meetings ago about the novelty of uh, analyzing a non-compliance uh, relative to a fishery that was not overfished and overfishing wasn't occurring. I think I appreciate the efforts, uh, NOAA appreciates the efforts that you all have um, done today to augment the record and better explain your rationale. Um, I particularly note Lynn's comments and Jason's comments. Um, if that's helpful, I think that will help the secretary better understand the position of the recommendation given to him. Incidentally, I, I do want to just interject when, when there was um, uh, the last motion that passed by unanimous consent, no fisheries would have abstained from that. We're in the decision-making process. Uh, we would be in a decision-making process if this carried. The, this motion has now become a little bit more problematic from, um, for the secretary, and I'm not talking about it being problematic on the merits, 
Um, certainly the secretary will uh, review whatever is sent. It will give it a, 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 he will give it an honest look, a hard look, and will consider all the facts before him. The difficulty, however, is that the secretary is not only going to be asked about, um, make a decision on the conservation basis for the 51,000 metric ton cap, as well as um, this, this novel concept of, of um, an ecosystem, the, the resource in question being an ecosystem or of a ecosystem resource. But now, if this motion passes, the secretary will need to figure out the conservation, not of 51,000 metric tons, but of some number beneath it, which hasn't yet been determined. So that is far more complicated than the um, than what was originally on the board and that which I spoke to a couple few meetings ago. Um, I, would, I would urge further examination of and, and discussion of what the actual number would be. And because I think that you all have worked so hard and you've, you've given your rationale for 51,000, but now all of a sudden the number 51,000 isn't the number anymore. It's some number lower than that. So if you could um, just, it would be helpful to consider that. You may want to consider the idea of a step-based approach. The idea of, of the original motion um, Moving forward with, an, with the original motion does not preclude you from f finding and raising this issue of the overage issue at a, some later date. Um, so uh, in any event, I, I'll leave those comments at that. Thank you. Thanks, Chip. Um, <clears throat> I think part of the reason for the motion right now is to, well, we're, we're struggling between clarity but not trying to undermine the effect of it. So, um, uh, and my suggestion, we're going to take a, maybe a five-minute break right now to have some discussion, to, and then we'll come back to the board. So just take a few minutes. Thanks. Okay, I think we have a path forward, and I think there's a suggestion for a motion. Dave Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the aspect of this, as I understand it, is very problematic for a legal counsel is, uh, is the second portion of the motion that related to the motion to amend, because it, it to some extent, makes presumptions uh, about actions that may happen in the future. Um, and so I think the appropriate uh, process we ought to follow is to pass a motion to reconsider the prior uh, motion to amend, put it on the table, and then separate it back out and take it out. So I would move to reconsider the prior motion to amend. Thanks, David. Do we have a second to that motion? Tom Fody. Do we have discussion? Uh, remember, this is going to take a two-thirds majority, so we're going to have to um, vote this up or down based upon that. Uh, is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, let's try to do this. Is there, well, let's, let's do a show of hands on who, all those in favor of the motion.
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. All right. All those opposed to the motion? Abstentions? No votes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just for clarity, I think where we are is you're back to the original motion that Menhaden, or that Menhaden Nicola brought forward from the Menhaden Board. Um, but we've, you know, the, the Menhaden Board motion is modified slightly to say that the policy board recommends to the commission. So it's um, now that that modification has happened, it, that motion is property of the policy board right now, and that will be the motion that you're, you're voting on. Okay, so we can we put the original motion back up again then? Okay, so we're back to the original motion, and this is a motion um, of, the, of the policy board now, since it was slightly modified from the species board. Um, is there a discussion on, on the motion? Dave Borden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I support the um, motion, but I want to make sure it's clear on the record that the staff uh, has the authority and is directed to fold in all of the arguments that have been brought forth today by uh, Jason and Lynn and others. Uh, and that also extends to the, to the scientific arguments that the Commission staff and others have put together <clears throat> in prior uh, written correspondence. Thanks, Dave. Other discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, I think we're ready to call the question. Uh, anybody need time for a caucus? Seeing none, we'll, show, but we'll do this by hands. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Anyone in opposite uh, abstentions to the motion? Two, abs two abstentions. Any null votes? Motion passes 16 to 0 to 2 to 0. Bell Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought this is the appropriate point. I just thought perhaps it was worthwhile to put on the record that, you know, that the commission has taken this action based on the, the science we've talked about, solid management principles, uh, adherence to our process, which is very important. So that's, that's what we're doing. So there's been discussion of the next step and what the secretary will do in terms of consideration. It, it might be worth pointing out that um, given that NOAA Fisheries uh, advises the secretary related to fisheries, that, um, that basically this action is also very consistent with NOAA Fisheries Strategic Plan for 2019 to 2022, in which discussing the challenges that we're facing in fisheries in, the, in this time period and in the future, that one of the things that they've said they want to do is to integrate ecosystem considerations uh, into stock assessments, fisheries management, and aquaculture. So I would also view what we're doing in terms of our recommendation as totally consistent with NOAA Fisheries' own strategic plan for the time period involved. Great. Thanks, Mel. Okay. Oh, Eric Reed, last word. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I actually missed the beginning of Mr. Borden's comment because I was talking to the incoming chair. Um, I would suggest that the policy board um, 
send a letter to the state of Virginia um, explaining what next year is going to look like given the current overages, just so we're all very clear what next year is going to look like. Right now, the bay cap would be about 35,000 tons. Um, but I, I think that that would, that would be some ink that would be well worth it, because that way they can understand what the commission's numbers and, the, and what's going to happen to that bay cap given the actions of this year. And if that, that tub dovetails in with David's comments, that would be great. Okay. I think that can be done. Thanks. Any other closing comments before we move on? Great. Thanks, everybody, for all that effort. Uh, we're back to item number six under the agenda, committee reports. Uh, first um, one we have is uh, the law enforcement. Um, Mark Robson has taken ill, and so we will not have an update from the law enforcement committee today. We will, um, once he is feeling better, we'll pull together a meeting summary, and I will email that out to the policy board for your review. Uh, all right, next we have uh, Habitat. Is Bob, you going to? Go ahead, Bob. Um, before the Habitat report, um, just I want everyone to know that um, this is Mark Robson's last meeting with the commission. He's decided to fully retire. He retired from the state of Florida uh, know, eight years ago, and he's been with us for the last eight years as our coordinator for our law enforcement committee. So we wish Mark the very, and Joni the very best when they, they move on to do other things. So Mark will not be around. It's too bad he wasn't here today. I wanted to uh, recognize him in front of, the, front of the policy board, but he's decided to uh, be a full-time retired person. So. We wish Mark all the best. Thanks, Bob. Okay, we're going to have uh, the uh, Habitat uh, Committee report from uh, Merrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you? Oh. Uh, if you want to yeah. sit closer to Just say next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Next. Okay. Um, the Habitat Committee met yesterday on Wednesday. We discussed the current habitat assessments underway in the Atlantic, one by the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership and one by the um, Federal Councils, the uh, Northeast uh, Regional Habitat Assessment. We received an update on uh, ACFIT. We worked at, in breakout groups on habitats of concern designations, and we discussed the possibility of having an SAV monitor, monitoring protocol developed. Uh, at that point, we reviewed, reviewed our progress on documents, the habitat hotline, the acoustic impacts on fish habitat, and fish habitats of concern. We came back together to update status. Next. The document, Aquaculture Impacts to Fish Habitat, this committee has been working on it since approximately 2014. Uh, based on some survey results amongst um, the group from the spring, we tailored the document in the summer and fall. It's gone through multiple iterations. And now we believe it's ready for approval with a focus on the text, not the formatting and layout of the document. The document contains sections on the effects of aquaculture on habitat, water quality, which includes water quality, sediment, and populations and communities. There's a section on common practices, tidal water mariculture and land-based mariculture, siting considerations, which includes minimizing the user conflicts, protecting habitats and carrying capacity. Next. And the sections um, continue with some conclusions, uh, common practices by state in a tabular form, resources for um, best management practices, some policy guidance um, linkage links, and links to state-specific permitting and leasing information. And the document concludes with, recommend, with uh, um, references. Questions? Any questions? John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the report. Uh, just curious on the aquaculture report. 
about the water quality um, in Delaware. We've just started permitting uh, shellfish aquaculture in the past three years, and uh, it's been very hyped up as the water quality benefits, particularly of oysters because of their filtering capacity. Are you finding those type of things in this report? The report looks at water quality for both a positive and negative benefit or impact, um, and the literature out in the public domain that we looked at generally suggests that shellfish aquaculture ha can have some net benefits um, from a habitat standpoint for fish. I figured as much, but I'm just, you, you haven't seen the, uh, the huge benefits that have been touted for this, like, you know, it's going to filter all the water in a uh, eutrophic coastal lagoon the way it's been plugged by some of the supporters of this. Other questions? Tom Fody. Well, I think it's been proven before when we look at the results of what zebra mussels did to the Great Lakes and the, how they cleaned out all the algae and everything else in the Great Lakes. So if you get a good situation. I also want to know if oysters do the same response as clam, uh, clam beds do, that we start to see ale grass around because of what's coming out of the clams and things like that. Does it, you see the same thing with oyster beds? The document does not go into that type of specifics. Other comments, questions? Okay, we're going to need a motion to adopt the report if uh, someone would like to offer one. John Clark, we have a second. I'm, so, I'm sorry, John. I didn't oh, I'm sorry. Do you need me to actually make a motion, or are we? Yes, if okay. you could just make a motion. Move to accept the report, the habitat uh, management series approval of the habitat management series aquaculture impacts to fish habitat along the Atlantic coast report. Perfect, John. Second by Malcolm Rhodes. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, any objection to the motion? Seeing none, we will adopt that by unanimous vote. Okay, our next order of business is uh, ACFIP and uh, Ken, Ken, I believe, is going to do the update on that. Come on up, Ken. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much for this opportunity to address the policy board today. Um, I'm going to give you a quick report on uh, what, was, what is being done with the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership. Uh, the steering committee met this Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we confirmed our, our fiscal year 20 project recommendations and uh, had an update on our conservation mapping projects. We developed a new action plan for the, uh, what is it, 2020-2021 <laughs> time frame. <laughs> Been with it for a while, so, you know, it's getting all confused in terms of time. Um, discussed outreach and communication initiatives. We reviewed our funding initiatives for, new, for our new business plan. And we discussed the status of the National Fish Habitat Conservation Through Partnerships Act. Relative to our 2020 NIFHAP U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service project uh, uh, proposal list that was provided, we received 13 application, applications. That was the second highest number of applications that we've uh, ever received. Uh, seven states provided those applications. We had uh, representation in the mid, north, and south Atlantic regions uh, of the partnership. We had seven passage projects, six benthic habitat projects, that included tidal vegetation, seagrass, and shellfish beds. We'll be recommending six of these projects to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for funding, um, and the recommendation deadline uh, is January 10th, 2020. 
relative to our 2020-2021 action plan, uh, this is a project that we do on a, on a, on a by, uh, what is it, biannual basis, and it is based on our, our 2017 to 2021 conservation strategic plan. The highlights for our action plan include uh, compiling BMPs affecting our priority habitats, sharing the importance of water quality on human and fish health, developing a methodology for using our habitat assessments, and developing a fundraising strategy to increase our funding base for those projects. We also endorse projects within ACFIP, and uh, we, we, at the meeting, we actually reviewed a project endorsement uh, for a project in Pimlico Sound, North Carolina, uh, known as the Swan Island Oyster Sanctuary. This is led by North Carolina uh, Division of Marine Fisheries and the National, I'm sorry, the um, North Carolina Coastal Federation. Um, it's part of a long-term management and restoration strategy in the Gene Preston Oyster Sanctuary Network. The project itself in, in totals a 60-acre uh, area of harvest-protected um, oysters containing nearly 40 acres of developed oyster habitat. The project itself will involve uh, the deposition of limestone and granite. It's estimated to uh, support nearly 50 million oysters in the system. It's intended to restore oyster and finfish populations through habitat availability, seed production, and water quality improvements. Uh, we have federal, for this project, we have federal, state, uh, non-governmental organization, and industry collaboration, a, good, a true partnership project. Also, uh, in the, uh, uh, during this year, NIFHAP, uh, we attended the NIFHAP uh, AS, uh, American Fisheries Service Film Festival, and uh, at the 2019 American Fisheries Society meeting. This occurred in Reno, Nevada, uh, on September 29th through October 3rd. There were over 80 films on fish habitat conservation at this meeting. ACFIP helps during the festival by supporting some of those activities. Um, some of the films uh, were from ACFIP regions, including uh, some of our endorsed projects. When they're uploaded to YouTube, obviously, we'll share the link with everybody so you all can uh, see some of the work that we're doing. At the meeting, we also elected a new uh, vice chair, Jessica Coakley, with the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, Council and the same chair is still present, me. <laughs> uh, we'd also like to thank very much uh, the ASMFC for your continued operational support. Uh, it has been phenomenal, and along with that, I'd like to just have a quick shout out for all of our, <laughs> for all of our Washington-based crew. <laughs> the Nats did it last night, so congratulations, guys. Thanks, Ken. So any questions or comments for Ken? Okay, Tina, thanks a lot, Ken. And, uh, next item is uh, management and science, and I understand Pat's going to lead us on that, so come on up, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Management and Science Committee met earlier this week on Tuesday. Um, it was the first time the committee met, um, I think since 2017. They haven't been meeting uh, very frequently, and so uh, we've made a point to try and re-engage the Management and Science Committee, uh, aka MSC. And just as a reminder to the policy board, of this committee's purpose, um, we were having some existentialist, you know, questions about what, what they're really there for. Um, in a nutshell, it's an oversight committee uh, providing advice to you all on issues that span coastal fishery science and fisheries management. So big picture questions, challenges that we have that impact uh, multiple species. Uh, this is the laundry list of their specific roles uh, and responsibilities. I'll highlight number two, again, evaluate and provide advice on cross-species or cross-cutting issues. Um, MSC is very uh, important on providing oversight to our peer review processes for stock assessments and new research surveys. And uh, they also have a key role 
in providing guidance on multi-species and ecosystem issues. A quick reminder of where the Management and Science Committee sits in the ASMFC process. Um, they are one of the scientific oversight committees that uh, can be formally tasked by the policy board or the executive committee. Um, oftentimes the, the committee can address these tasks themselves, uh, but they will also delegate or farm out the work to, uh, in the past, for example, the Multi-Species Technical Committee and more recently the Ecological Reference Points Work Group, which you're all well aware of and we, we touched on earlier this morning. Um, going back a little further, five or ten years ago, they also uh, were tasked with projects uh, to investigate gear technology improvements to reduce bycatch discards. And um, the NEMAP program, which is now over a decade in existence, uh, was identified as a need uh, by the Management Science Committee, and, and they put together the design and the selection of the uh, survey team for NEMAP. Uh, we'll also highlight that MSC works very closely with our Assessment Science Committee on uh, reviewing stock assessment schedule and, and making sure we can handle uh, workload up and down the coast uh, from all your technical committee members. And again, um, we wanted to remind you all as the policy board uh, that you're welcome to task this committee at, at any time. Um, I touched on some of these, but, but past projects have included um, development of multi-species models centered around uh, Atlantic Menhaden. I mentioned gear technology. But perhaps the most in, important role that MSC has is to periodically review the Commission's research priorities um, and to try to boil them down, uh, look for themes across species, and develop proposals to address some major issues or data deficiencies that we have. I mentioned NEMAP, uh, that's how that program was started. Um, more recently, they also saw the need for greater uh, discard data from the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program, and so we were able to write a proposal and get, I think, about five years of funding from ACCSP to improve our observer coverage. The the last uh, formal task that the policy board gave to the Management and Science Committee was related to climate change and fisheries issues. Um, this is back in 2014, 2015, uh, where you all tasked uh, MSC to evaluate potential impacts on four stocks, summer flounder, black sea bass scup, I think winter flounder was in there as well. Um, the committee completed that task uh, largely by working with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and reported back to you all on it. Um, subsequent to that, members of the MSC also contributed to a, a hybrid group uh, of commissioners and, and scientists to develop a fairly new document, ASMSC's Climate Science and Fisheries Management Strategies. So to um, bring us up to speed with this week's discussions at the committee meeting, um, they jump back into the climate and fisheries uh, issues. Uh, receiving a presentation from the Southeast Fisheries Science Center on the development of their South Atlantic Climate Vulnerability Assessment. Uh, this will use a um, broad range of environmental data as well as fish monitoring data to identify which stocks in that region may be most susceptible to climate impacts. Another presentation that the committee received was from the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, historically, ASMFC has um, received scientific support on uh, things like the horseshoe crab adaptive resource model development and implementation, uh, a few other projects. But in the last couple years, um, there's been renewed support from USGS, uh, largely to the credit of Tom O'Connell, formerly with Maryland DNR, who now leads uh, USGS's Science Center in the Northeast. Um, that's a quick list of the new projects that USGS received funding for and is helping us with. Uh, the, the last discussion item that MSC covered was on wind energy and fisheries. Um, MSC 
discuss their possible role in gathering the science on wind development effects on fisheries resources. Um, they expressed an interest in supporting pre and post construction monitoring and developing guidance for that before and after uh, wind farms are installed and how does that affect our fisheries resources. Um, but they did want to come back to you and seek guidance on whether um, we need a separate ASMFC committee um, to dig into this. The MSC did not feel that they were the appropriate group. They're not working day to day on the wind and fisheries issues. Um, but as you all are, are well aware, you have staff that are engaged in this and it, it can be fairly time consuming. Um, so it's a question of whether we want to form a different committee of your, your staff to cross pollinate and, and you know, develop lessons learned um, or if we want to stay out of that um, and just encourage direct participation by uh, your state personnel in the uh, Rhoda or Rosa uh, venues. Um, and so that's a question to you all. I don't know if you can answer it today, but something to think about. Um, and finally, um, we left off with you know, what's on the Management Science Committee's horizon. Um, another presentation that they received was on management strategy evaluations by Dr. McNamee. Uh, folks were pretty excited about this. In a nutshell, MSCs are a tool that will um, use simulation models to uh, provide different management options or approaches um, that may in inform how we uh, improve our management. They talked about uh, key stocks that might be ripe for an MSE. Uh, they include uh, striped bass, menhaden, drum and lobster. Uh, we talked about shad, but that slide's wrong. Uh, lobster. Um, the committee also received a presentation from Tony on our stock status definitions relative to our annual review of the stocks. Um, and so the MSC will uh, be working on establishing clear stock status definitions to aid that annual review. Uh, again, they will be moving forward to revisit the Commission's research priorities, uh, hopefully develop some themes and proposals to pursue funding. Um, depending on the outcomes of the ERP and Menhaden assessments that go through peer review next week, um, MSC has had a historical role in uh, multi-species issues and science, and so they may be able to support the ERP work group uh, and the Menhaden board moving forward. Um, and most recently, through the executive committee discussion uh, yesterday, there was a request or a task to explore new approaches to soliciting public input on the fisheries management process. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Thanks, Pat. Questions for Pat? John Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Pat. Um, I just want to go back to your, your wind power. You were suggesting that uh, for that to be pursued further within AS, the ASMFC states that we would need to develop a new committee because I know, I mean, a lot of these uh, wind power issues are going to be common to all states and it seems like it would be a good idea to coordinate. So I'll, I'll give a partial answer and maybe uh, throw it to Bob to, to round it out. Um, but if you recall where we left off from our August workshop with Garfo and the Commission, I think the bottom line was we were going to take a limited role in this activity. Um, that, that you all are engaged, you know, with, with folks like Bohm and Noah and others. Um, and so I think our our sideboards were, you know, provide opportunities. The ASMFC will provide opportunities to coordinate information and how things are going may be able to uh, provide support for personnel or staff within the states. And then uh, I think Bob sits on the Rota uh, or the Rosa um, group. It's a, a new partnership or, or external partnership uh, to communicate on these issues. So that's where we left off uh, in August. And this is MSC's question to you all, we, whether we you know, stay at that point where the August uh, recommendations uh, settled or if we do something more. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on that topic, I, 
I think I'd come down on the side of this body not forming some sort of special committee or anything to get engaged on that topic. I know my experience in recent years is this offshore wind thing has snowballed and become a bigger and bigger thing. At first, it was sort of bewildering all the different work groups and technical groups, and you know we were getting requests to attend eight different meetings. And um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that Rosa and Rhoda will sort of become kind of the catalyst for regional cooperation and, and work on these issues. And so I think going the path of individual states being engaged with that process, however they can be, I, I think. It is helpful if the commission can periodically do something like that workshop we had in August where we can sort of have something that updates everyone here on what's going on. But uh, I think I would come down more on the side of what you were talking about, the commission having sort of limited involvement and not forming another special committee or group to get involved with wind development. Yeah, agree, Justin. All right. Uh, I got Dan McKiernan and Tom. Please keep it quick because uh, the South Atlantic Board wants to get out of here today before the weather. So. Uh, thank you. Pat, uh, would it be appropriate for the Management Science Committee to do an overview or to give us advice on the emerging eDNA studies that are popping up? It seems to be a, a, a new tool that has some people excited, and I'm wondering if, the, if that group could take that on. Yes, they can do that. Uh, we've heard about some research for stocks like river herring um, and others. I think that's where USGS may come in handy. They have a lot of scientific expertise in that arena, so we can add that to the list. Tom, you get, oh, you're good, okay. All right, Pat, thanks for that. And we'll, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things with offshore wind that everyone's struggling with. Okay, we're gonna go into assessment science and Sarah Murray's gonna do the update for us, so Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the Assessment Science Committee met in August of this year to address several agenda items, including receiving updates from the Red Drum Subcommittee, discussing stock assessment training workshops, and reviewing the ASMFC stock assessment schedule. Note that there are plans to have an advanced stock assessment training in late 2019 or early 2020, as well as an introduction to stock assessments course, which will start in January 2020. Staff will be reaching out in the near future to partners to seek nominees for the introductory course. The ASC discussed and approved the draft stock assessment schedule at their August meeting. The stock assessment schedule proposed by the committee is available in meeting materials. However, I'll also briefly review the changes that were made since the schedule was last approved by the board in, at the 2018 annual meeting. Before diving into individual changes, I just wanted to note a higher level change that took place and affected a number of the species in the Northeast region. After an extensive review, the Northeast Region Coordinating Council made changes to both the assessment type and frequency in the Northeast in an effort to match assessment demands with assessment capacity. The new approach includes two main types of assessments, a management attract assessment which allows for small to moderate changes and is similar to our assessment updates, and a research track assessment, which will be open to more substantial changes, similar to benchmark assessments. This will affect a number of changes in the schedule. The revised stock assessment schedule now extends to 2022. As a result, assessment triggers were added in 2022 for American eel, Atlantic croaker, Atlantic sturgeon, river herring, and spot based on a five-year assessment trigger frequency for these species. The American shad assessment is now scheduled to be completed in 2020 instead of 2019 due to delays in the assessment process. An assessment update was added for Atlantic Menhaden in 2022 based on a three-year assessment trigger frequency. An attentive update was also added for the Atlantic Menhaden ERP assessment to match the single species assessment schedule. However, the schedule de will depend on the results of the peer review for the single species assessment and ERP assessment taking place next week through CDAR. Management track assessments were added for Atlantic Herring in 2020 and 2022 for the changes to the Northeast region schedule. The striped bass assessment update was shifted from 2020 to 2021 in order to better align with the timing of draft addendum six. 
The black drum assessment trigger was shifted from 2019 to 2022 based on the technical committee's recommendation. Black sea bass schedule was changed as a result of the changes in the Northeast. As a result, an assessment update in 2020 was removed and replaced with the management track assessment in 2021. A research track assessment through SARC was also added for fall 2022. The bluefish schedule was also adjusted per the changes in the Northeast region. The five-year assessment trigger was removed from 2020 and replaced with the management track assessment for 2021. A research track assessment through SARC was also added for fall 2022. Two assessments through CDAR were added for coastal sharks, one in 2020 for Atlantic black tip sharks and one in 2022 for hammer, hammerhead sharks. Jonah crab was added to the species list, though no assessments are currently scheduled for this species. The assessment updates for northern shrimp in 2019 and 2020 were removed, as we will not be conducting a full assessment update given the moratorium. However, there will still be data updates conducted with the TLA during this time. A benchmark assessment through CDAR was added in 2022 for red drum. A management track assessment was added for SCUP in 2021 as a result of the Northeast region changes. The Spanish mackerel benchmark assessment in 2020 was removed and replaced with an operational assessment through CDAR in 2021. This change is largely due to the fact that the lead analyst was needed for other assessments. Per the changes in the Northeast region, the spiny dogfish updates in 2019 and 2022 2020 were removed and a research track assessment through SARC was added for spring 2022. Changes to the summer flounder schedule were also made in keeping with the Northeast schedule. The 2019 and 2020 updates were removed and a management track assessment was added for 2021. Management track assessments for winter flounder were added in 2020 and 2022 also in keeping with the Northeast region schedule. All other species assessments scheduled to remain the same as the schedule previously approved by the board. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Any questions for Sarah? Adam Walski. For the three species that were added for shark assessment, are there specific research topics that are known to be coming to the table for black sea bass, bluefish, and spiny dogfish that put them into that research track in the next three years? Or is it just an open holding spot with an opportunity for people to bring something should they have something? Are you referring to the activity in 2022 for sea bass and others? Yeah. Um, for sea bass, you know, there remain questions about stock structure. I think we went from a, you know, coastwide to a north-south um, stock split in the most recent iteration or benchmark. Um, so there continues to be research that may further inform that. I don't want to overpromise, but um, I think that's the the focus there for black sea bass. Uh, was the other one bluefish and spiny dogfish? And spiny dogfish. Um, I know for spiny dogfish, it's a pretty basic assessment. It's a swept area uh, estimate, and so there may be advances in, in how they can uh, mine spiny dogfish. But I'd have to defer any other information. We could probably check with the Science Center and give you some more details. Adam, I do know that uh, at the NRCC meeting, we did discuss um, for the spiny dogfish assessment to look at components of uh, male-only fisheries, I believe it is, um, over time or in the future. Okay, the other question for Sarah. And in addition, there's, it's called a research track, but it doesn't necessarily always have to mean that there's research added. It's just a language change in how the assessments are what they're called through the new sauce arc process other question for sarah seeing none thanks for the report sarah all right we need uh, essentially we need to uh approve the changes to the stock assessment um so um i don't know if we need a motion is this Oh, Jason. 
as an action. I could provide a motion if you'd like, Mr. Chair. Um, so I will make a motion since all the questions are over. I move to approve the ASMFC stock assessment schedule as presented today. Okay, second, John Clark. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, any opposition to the motion? Seeing none, we'll adopt that by unanimous consent. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're to other business. Uh, we had a couple of items, so Pat, you've got one, so take it away. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under Over the last few days, there's been a reoccurring theme in regards to the use of circle hooks. Uh, in particular, we heard from uh, Deputy Chief Blanchard from Rhode Island uh, at the Striped Bass Board about some of the complexities in regards to enforcement. And at the Law Enforcement Committee, there was a lot of talk about the simplicity of enforcement with circle hooks when multiple species are covered by that. Um, and you know, we, every time circle hooks come up, it's, it's pertaining to a stock status issue where we're trying to help a stock out instead of thinking about it kind of upfront and more proactively. So with that in mind, I have a motion to task the Management and Science Committee. I would move to have the Management and Science Committee investigate discard mortality across all species. This review should focus on the use of circle hooks and or other tools that would address discard mortality. Thanks, Pat. Do we have a second to that motion? Doug Grab. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, let's start with Dan. Pat, do you mean investigate discard mortality related to hook and line fisheries? I don't think you want them to focus on dragger and gillnet discards. Well, I, uh, I really didn't want to try to impede any investigation that might take us into a different direction. The, f the main focus would definitely be hook and line. Um, that was definitely the theme over the week. Um, but if there are other issues associated with discard mortalities that might pop up along the way, it would be nice to get comments back from the committee on them. Jason. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, looking for clarification on what exactly we we want them to do and so I, I think maybe the logical thing is just kind of like a synthesis of existing literature is that the idea with this task I think that would be a good a good starting point Jason I think beyond that um, you know species by species what's what are the challenges maybe there's some regulatory components that become challenging uh, as well but uh, I think kind of just brainstorming through some of the the bigger issues associated with going management board by management board as well um, as it pertains to circle hooks. Other comments, questions? <clears throat> okay, is there, I think it's been read in already by Pat, so I think we're covered on that. So is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, we'll adopt that by unanimous consent. Uh, Dennis, do you have an additional item or did you have something else you wanted to put on previous discussion? Okay, I'll come back to you. Uh, first, we wanted to talk with Pennsylvania on TATOG. Tony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess it's just a direct question to Andy, and I believe you're, you know what the question is, but just for the information for everybody else, um, the TATOG Management Board has recently implement, or started a tagging program for all commercially caught TATOG. Uh, which requires all to talk to have a tag attached to them. Um, the state of Pennsylvania does not have a commercial fishery for Tatog, is not on the Tatog management board, but there is a large market for Tatog in the state. And so we wanted to have a discussion with Pennsylvania on the possibilities or options for um, making sure that not non-tagged to tog could not be sold in the state. Andy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we've done something like this before. It's in, uh, it's in our regulations. We had a regulation for importation of tog in the past. I say tog. I don't say ta-tog because I fished in New Jersey, so it's tog from here on in for me. 
Um, we had importation regulations for them in the past because they come into the Philly market and the Philly market's pretty big. We had a regulation for weak fish in the past on, on a, uh, a size limit. So this is something that we can do. I've talked to our law enforcement already about them making visits to the Philly market in particular or into any uh, fish markets, particularly in the Philadelphia area and looking for tag tog. But tag tog, that sounds pretty funny. So. We're going to have to do some rulemaking to do this, though. So for us, typically, we put something out for uh, proposed rulemaking. We do it at one commission meeting. Our meetings are quarterly. Our next meeting will be in January. And then we put out for public rulemaking, usually a 30 or 60 day comment period. The soonest we could do it would be the April or early May commission meeting. So we can do this. We can put something in place. And our law enforcement has agreed to to take some swings by the market and some of the other places and look for the tagged fish. So um, didn't know I was needed at the TOG board meeting the other day, but glad that it was brought up here in uh, other business. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Any uh, questions on that? Jason. Uh, no question. Just wanted to extend uh, thanks to Pennsylvania and to Andy. I, I think uh, this would be an important um, thing to have in place. There, there would have been kind of a, I don't know if a loophole is the right word, but um, so this will be really helpful, and I thank him for the effort. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Andy, for the uh, effort. Okay, Dennis, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This week we heard a lot about losses here in the commission. Bob Ballou's leaving, now Mark Robeson, Dr. Pierce, but a lot closer to home not only do we have a commission loss, but here in the New Hampshire delegation, we have a loss at the table. Doug Grout is retiring. I spent the last couple years asking Doug every time we went to a meeting, when are you going to retire? <laughs> Finally and reluctantly, <laughs> he came clean and told us when he was going to retire. And for us at the table, it's a big loss. The three of us have sat here together for approximately 13 years. And Richie and I spent probably 12 years with our dear friend, John Nelson. During that time, the three of us, I think, have developed into like a three-headed monster. <laughs> you know, we're, we think pretty much alike. It's somewhat, it's funny when everyone goes off and caucuses that the three of us sit here, we've already done our caucusing. I mean, we, <laughs> we're of like mind so much, it's, I think we're quite a unit. But personally, I have to give credit to Doug for his patience, for keeping me focused on the issues. He's always been willing to discuss the issues, always willing to offer his technical expertise to us at his office here, wherever and whenever. And as a little sidelight, I visit, visit and visited Doug many, 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 many times at his office because it's only five miles from my home. At the conclusion of any meeting, Doug always left his office and walked me to the door. Always did that. I don't know if he was trying to get rid of me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciated that. And so to Doug Grout, I wish him tight lines, smooth sailing, and a bravo Zulu. And I'll turn the, to Michael. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd like to just add, uh, <clears throat> Dennis has said most of it for sure. Um, <clears throat> Gordon Colvin um, always talked about uh, when things got tough, <clears throat> you listen to the silverbacks. And that's where he described the, the uh, commissioners that had been there a long time and had a lot of experience. <clears throat> and Doug is certainly a silverback. And um, <clears throat> we're going to miss him at the table, both from a technical standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint, because <clears throat> he's a good friend. Doug, any parting comments? Just thank you to my team. And thank you to you all for the great work you've all done. I'm going to miss you.
I would have thought you guys were the three musketeers. I just couldn't figure out who D'Artagnan was. So uh, maybe that's the uh, maybe Doug going. So Doug, been great. Also, it's been a terrific experience working with you. So good luck. Okay, uh, I think unless there's are there any other business to come before the policy board. Okay, seeing none, we're going to adjourn the policy board and we're going to go right into business. So don't go away. Um, we're just going to take up the uh, first item. And the first item is to consider changes to the rules and regulations to